All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Agronomy in Action Insight Series. Today, we will be covering the future of drone technology and UAV scouting and spray applications. We're very excited to have each and every one of you on this morning, and we look forward to a great hour together. Today, we have three presenters representing our drone message. You will hear from myself, Julia Kamen, a technical training lead at Syngenta. We also have Samantha Courtbein on. She is an agronomist with Golden Harvest with ample drone background. And then we have Ben Johnson, a territory sales manager for Rantizo. So very excited for the representatives on the call today. Our webinar will be kind of broken into three different sections. We'll cover a drone industry overview uh, with myself. Then we'll get into drone scouting and drone spray applications. Samantha will support our drone scouting message on how Golden Harvest is leveraging aerial imagery in the field with drone deploy. And then Ben will be on to talk through drone spray applications on how drones fit in pesticide applications today and tomorrow, along with what services Rantizo has to offer. Today, I'm gonna to get us kicked off here. So today, farming operations look drastically different than they did just a few decades ago. New technology has allowed farmers to optimize pretty much every aspect of their farming operation. And a big part of this transformation can be attributed to drones. When it comes to drones, we can use uh, various different terminologies when referring to them. And for the most part, they're all interchangeable. In today's presentation between myself and the other presenters, you'll hear us refer to drones in a few different, uh, in, in a few different titles. You'll hear us call them drones, unmanned aircraft systems or UAS, an unmanned aerial vehicle or a UAV, or an unmanned aircraft. What all of these have in common is that they are aircrafts that are piloted by remote controls and onboard computer systems. If we take a step back and we look a little bit around the history of unmanned aircrafts, I think a few would be surprised to know that they were developed, or the concept of drones and unmanned aircrafts were developed in the 1800s. It wasn't until eight, or 1916 that the first pilotless winged aircraft was controlled by a radio control. Fast forward 90 years, in 2016, drones began to be used more widely for disaster relief, border surveillance, inspecting pipelines, fighting wildfires, etc. This was also the year that the FAA issued its first commercial drone permit. That's a long time after they were first um, kind of brought to light. In 2011, drones made their breakthrough in agriculture, mainly due to equipment becoming more affordable and having it be easier to use. In 2013, Jeff Bezos announced that Amazon was considering using drones to deliver parcels, which generated huge public interest both in the business sector, but also for personal use. It wasn't until 2016 that the FAA published rules for commercial drone operations. They basically came in and, and created a knowledge assessment, um, some requirements around registering your drone, along with some rules around where and where you cannot fly drones. As we, as we kind of fast forward into current day, there are many different sectors that we're using drones in. This diagram kind of illustrates the six different areas that we primarily use drones in the United States. You can kind of also see the, the, the amount of drones based on that sector. So for agriculture, we'll get into this here heavily in today's webinar, but those are primarily used for crop monitoring and inspection, along with some spray application and livestock management. We then have surveillance and monitoring where we're using drones for traffic management and crowd monitoring, along with different disaster management relief um, organizations. Drones are also used for transportation, uh, for warehouse management and shipping, along with security. And then the three areas where drones make up the most is building systems, delivery systems, and inspections. So we're using drones when it comes to taking videos of 
buildings at different angles, carrying material to hard to get places, um, et cetera. We're also using drones for delivery, so delivering medicines and relief packages to remote areas or rural areas, along with some e-commerce systems. And then lastly, probably the biggest sector is inspections. So using drones to inspect power lines, uh, plant inspections, areas with hazardous material to kind of replace that human um, in that scenario. So we've come a very long way um, in where we're using drones in the United States currently. If an individual wants to fly a drone commercially or for their business, they are required to get their Part 107 license. Ben will expand on this a little bit later, but part of this is also registering your drone. This slide indicates the number of active and forecasted commercial UAS units in the U.S. today. As I mentioned, the FAA didn't regulate uh, registrations until, until 2016. And you can see over the last six years in the graph to the left, the steady incline that we've seen in drone registrations in the US. We currently sit just over 622,000 registered drones being flown um, here in the United States. When we look to the right hand side of our screen, this is the forecasted view of where we're headed with drones. This gives us kind of an outlook for the next three to four years. And you can see at the bottom of that box on your right hand, hand side of the screen that, there, that we are predicting by 2026, there'll be 858,000 drones in the sky. So these reports were pulled directly from the FAA Aerospace uh, Fiscal Year Review. Um, and as we can see here, not only are drones gonna stay consistent for us, but they're actually also gonna increase as we move um, into the future. Part of this is just due to the advancements that we've seen in drones. Um, we can, I think everyone in the industry can agree that every new drone that hits the market is better than the last. And that some, this can be for an ample amount of reasons. Maybe they're faster, maybe they have better battery life, they're more aerodynamic, uh, but it also has to do with some of the advancements that you see on your screen here. We're now able to do better work when it comes to mission and task planning. We have better image processing and faster image processing, which is attributed to a lot of success in agriculture. We have wireless multimedia communication, along with autonomous navigation, uh, more precise landing, and improved photogrammetry. So all of these things are attributing to why drones are increasing, just for the mere fact that the technology is getting smarter and more advanced. As we look into agriculture, which we'll spend the rest of the call kind of focused on, there are many different use cases for drones, and they've really proven themselves over the last 10 years. We're able to use drones in many different areas on the farm. We're able to evaluate crop health. We're able to scout better in the field and cover more ground. We're also able to spray with drones, uh, which we'll expand upon. Things like fertilizer, um, our chemistry, like herbicide, fungicide, and pesticides. We're also able to spread seed like cover crop with drones. Another section in agriculture that we're using drones is for the monitoring side. So we can monitor diseases and weeds in the field along with nutrients. A big area is monitoring um, irrigation equipment, which can be a very dangerous job in ag. We're also able to monitor soil moisture and evapotranspiration. So things that we were never able to do just through walking through a field. We also are able to count and account for livestock on farms. At the end of the day, what we're able to do with drones and agriculture is really get a new perspective of where and what is happening in our fields and how we can be more efficient. So for the remainder of our time, we're really gonna focus on crop scouting and crop spraying. Um, and Samantha and Ben will take over kind of those sections here. But I did want to ask and kind of pose a question to the participants on the call today. And that is, what is your current status when it comes to drones on your operation? We have a about 50% of the call here that are using drones for scouting. And so it's a very exciting uh, number. 72 of you are in fact out there with drones uh, scouting your fields. We also have about 35% or 27% of the call uh, that are interested in investing in drones. So hopefully you find value in the next two sections and uh, find ways that you could potentially um, incorporate drones into your operations. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Samantha 
to continue the message around scouting here. The floor is yours, Samantha. Thanks, Julia. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to dive into how we're using drones for scouting purposes, specifically at Golden Harvest, but also kind of take a broader look a little bit as well. To dive into where we currently are at at Golden Harvest, we have drones across all of our agronomists and a lot of our direct sellers here at Golden Harvest. We're using DJI drones, and for those of you who are familiar with some different uh, drones out there, we're using Mavic 2 Pros and Air 2S drones. And then we're taking this a step farther using a, a third-party software called Drone Deploy. You can see their interface over here on the right-hand side. And that helps with the flight plans. It makes it very easy for our pilots. They just make a flight plan and then the drone does the rest. You don't even have to touch the controls. And then the other important part is the analytics at the end. So once the drone lands, we're able to get some insights depending on the different type of flight that we completed. So to dive into those different flights, um, I'll first show how this interface kind of works. If you've not flown a drone before with Drone Deploy, this is how um, it would look on my iPad as I'm flying. So all I have to do is draw a boundary on the outside of the field, and then the software takes care of the rest. So it determines the path of which the drone should take. It has to determine how uh, much each of the photos should overlap to make sure that when the flight is over, we have one complete orthomosaic image based upon the hundreds of images that the drone is capturing in this short amount of time. So you can see with this uh, size of field, it only takes about 15 minutes to capture the entire field in one image. And uh, we are able to monitor what's going on in real time. So that's the real value to us in Drone Deploy is that we are able to see what's going on in the field from those images, but then also having that field start to kind of come together as the drone is flying. Um, we can fly at lots of different heights. In this specific one, I'm flying about 400 feet. Um, and you can see how many images it's capturing there. Uh, you're able to view different things automatically. In this instance, there was some lodging um, and already start to figure out where we should be looking and taking those next steps when we're out there at the field. So to us, the value of using drone deploy or the value of having drones to scout is really this ability to turn drones just from toys or the ability to take nice photos um, into a resource that we can use while we're out there at the field as agronomists or sellers uh, for our producers. So we're able to look at those fields in real time, um, able to monitor a large area of the field and figure out where we should go take a closer look instead of just wandering through the field trying to get an estimate. Um, we're able to look at plant health. It monitors where there might be areas of potential stress or where the field might be healthier and where we can go take a closer look there. We're able to reduce costs or even help uh, maintain yield by detecting where there's areas of field stress, things like diseases, areas of weeds, different things like that where there might be additional drought stress and able to really monitor those and then also quantify the area that's affected. Another big uh, use of drones for us in scouting has been to see the effects of weather. So um, after large wind events, uh, to monitor green snap, after hail, um, to evaluate if there needs to be replant, all those types of things we can uh, better understand after weather, uh, different ef uh, effects there. We're able to look at vari field variability. You can see here in the back of the field, there's some iron uh, deficiency chlorosis. And so you can see the variability across the field, but we're also able to look at that at emergence. And I'll show that here in a second. So beginning with um, a type of flight that we do early in the spring between the V2 and V5 growth stage of both corn and soybeans, we can do stand counts on those newly emerged plants. So this is what the output of that type of flight would be. Um, I'm sure many of you have gone out and done stand counts before where you are manually out there measuring and then having to count uh, throughout the field. Uh, in this flight, which probably only took between 10 to 15 minutes, I'm able to capture 56 stand counts in that short amount of time. Also, this report is generated within five minutes of the drone landing, so it's a very quick turnaround time. You can see here that it's able to uh, determine the estimated population in this plot. And then also you can highlight kind of areas where something may have happened. Maybe this was a wet spot or something happened in an area based upon the pattern that this uh, imagery was able to pick up. And how it's able to do that 
is by looking at these individual photos. So if I clicked on one of these, it'd bring up a photo um, that shows what the drone is seeing. It's putting a red dot on each of the corn plants here and evaluating the spacing in between each of those plants and highlighting if there's too big of a space by a yellow box. So we're getting a population, an estimated gap analysis, and able to really dive into uh, how that planting uh, was and evaluate that performance. Another type of flight that we're doing in season is plant health. So this flight is most successful after the crop has completely canopied and we've kind of closed and can no longer see all the soil there. Um, the first type of map that the drone is creating is this RGB image. So that stands for red, green, blue. It's what we'd see just with our own eyes. And you can see that this field would look really uniform. Um, it looks really great. But if we dive in a little bit closer, you might be able to pick up on some additional things. So on the left is what you would see from satellite imagery. This is using NDVI, which is a normalized difference uh, vegetative index. And satellite imagery has a lot of really great benefits from its timeliness. It's really easy to access, but there is one drawback and that's the resolution. So you can see here that we're getting really large pixels. Um, it's about 10 meters per pixel of resolution versus our imagery can be as high of resolution as half of an inch to two inches per pixel. So you're really able to dive in what's going on. So we're using a slightly different vegetative index, VARI, but similar concept where we're looking at both stressed versus healthy parts of the field. And I'll just point out here, like there's some instances where it may just be one row that's affected by something and we'd wanna go check that out versus in other imagery sources, it may just look like a larger area than what actually is going on. So there's value to both, but this is what we're capturing with using drones for these scouting purposes. Just to provide another example of the value of this plant health imagery, this is a field captured, uh, I think two years or last year, where we were here on the side of the field and we saw that there was some stress here with soybeans um, in the center part of the field. So we know that something is going on. We know that we need to take a closer look. But with this bird's eye view from the drone, we're able to actually pick up on the patterns that you can see um, from this angle that we would not be able to see from just walking the field. And from here, we're able to see the wheel tracks of the different directions of the different applications that spring and able to provide a recommendation of ways to manage compaction and that traffic on the plant uh, for next year. So then once we are able to see and diagnose what's going on in the field from these scouting techniques, we can then quantify the area that's affected. So I'm able to find an area and draw a polygon around that area, make notes of what is potentially going on out there. And then uh, this will actually give us an estimated area. So that's really uh, important to know the number of acres that are affected. For instance, if you know that there's a large weed, weed patch and you need to know how much spray you need to mix up um, and make for that recommendation. So um, lots of great uses by knowing the exact and being able to quantify the area that's affected in these um, fields. So moving on to another type of flight that our pilots commonly use is a panorama flight. So a limitation of drone technology has sometimes been the turnaround time and the amount of time it takes in the field. This flight helps with that. So this is a five minute flight. It only takes 27 images and you can really get high resolution imagery. This is at our Slater uh, Iowa slight, site. And you can really quickly pick up on some differences in the fields from the different hybrids. And like I said, it's five minutes. You get this turned around fairly quickly, and then you're able to go take a closer look. Um, it's also just great for great imagery of field events like was done in this instance. Finally, uh, this is our final kind of type of flight that we're using with Drone Deploy, and this is for 3D models. So 3D models are used more commonly in other industries, but in agriculture, we are using it for silage piles. So here, this is a silage pile that I captured, and it actually is estimating the volume um, based upon it uses an elevation and estimates the height. And then if I'm able to know the density of that material, I can then calculate or the software calculates for me the volume of the material in that pile.
And for silage, a common question from producers is how much shrinkage there is over time. And if I go back to that silage pile, uh, like for instance, once a month or do it multiple times throughout the season, I can then fly the same flight plan. The drone deploy software makes that very simple to do. And then I can reevaluate how that changes over time um, using different elevation and um, just monitoring how this pile is changing. Another challenge that drone deploy has helped overcome is the, the able to share all this data. Um, many of you have probably experienced trying to text or email large files or videos, and that that can be a huge challenge. Um, drone deploy helps with that. It uploads it to the cloud very quickly from your drone, and then you can easily text it or email it and get it onto your farmer's hands almost immediately. So kind of summarize the value that we see. So it's this directed scouting, the idea that I can fly a field, see where there's potential points where something is different and I need to go figure out what's going on. It'll help figure out where I'm walking in that field and if whether I've reached that destination or that point that I'm trying to get to. And there I can document, take extra point or take pictures, notes, and have that in a nice scouting report. Um, we're able to help diagnose stresses prior to harvest, figure out what's going on while the crop is still in the field, and help figure out how that could potentially affect the yield potential that you might be seeking. And then finally, just understanding that full story, looking at emergence, looking at that plant health, um, and figuring out what that's going to mean for your operation and making those valuable recommendations. So that's where we currently are. I'll just take a moment here to talk about where the future of drone scouting may be going. Um, so not necessarily with drone deploy, but many of you have experience with drones, have seen um, this data capture and analysis piece. And then Ben will be diving into this application part. But there's this middle ground here where there's like figuratively a gray area that we're still, the industry is trying to figure out. It would be great from a farmer's perspective to be able to create variable rate prescriptions directly and easily from this data we captured. It'd be great to be able to create management zones from this data, um, potentially better time applications from if we flew multiple times and figured out when the disease was coming in and when the best time to spray a fungicide would be. Um, or there's different um, applications for being able to estimate your yield prior to harvest. So this is where we would like to go as an industry. Unfortunately, there's lots of challenges to get there. Um, for instance, drone imagery is very relative. We're using a vegetative indice that's creating relative values that is heavily influenced by different hybrids. Or if you're able to see the soil in that image, the different color of the soil can influence the different values. The time of day, um, also if they're cloud cover, so if there's the, the big poofy clouds that are creating shadows, shadows on the field, that's all influencing what the data will provide for you. Um, in addition to that, um, if you're creating variable rate maps or if you are trying to estimate yield, you would need additional information into these types of models. So potentially the weather that's happened that season or a calibration block. So for instance, for to make a nitrogen variable rate prescription using imagery, it is a common practice to have to have an area with a very low nitrogen rate or a very high nitrogen rate in order to calibrate that imagery. So just some additional information that would be needed to make these types of things accurate. Um, finally, it would take a lot of frequent flying. Um, you'd have to be out in the field to do a lot of these uh, flying almost weekly in order to estimate timing or anything like that. And then the quick um, turnaround time of this analysis. So we can make prescription maps for applications, but this seamless process where it makes it very easy for the producer, that's what's gonna take some time to get there. There are companies working on this, which is why I just brought a few of them up here at the bottom. I am most familiar with Sentinel Fertigation. This company came out of research done on a team I was on at the University of Nebraska, um, where they're timing fertigation events based upon imagery. There's also uh, Verimax, which is using it to time uh, uh, irrigation events. And then Pix4D is a, a great software that could help make prescription maps. But um, like I said, there's still a lot of room for growth and potential in this drone scouting space. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Ben um, with Rantizo. All right, thank you, Samantha. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm Ben Johnson with uh, Rantizo and we are all about drone applications. And uh, first, I've been in the, the drone uh, business for, for a little bit now. So this is actually an image uh, from Google Earth in 2017 of the fertilizer uh, uh, a retailer where I used to work at. And there's a picture of me flying my Phantom 2 um, in my little test plot there. So that was uh, kind of fun. But yeah, at, at Rantizo, our, our mission is to make air application by drone safe, legal, and productive. Uh, so we've got a, a pretty wide range of uh, operators in our network, uh, really uh, from coast to coast, border to border, uh, very much centralized in the in the corn belt here. Uh, lots of pilots and we keep growing uh, every day. And so drone applications, um, there's a lot of use cases that are uh, where, where the drone is a really great tool. So fungicide is really the, the bread and butter application, uh, as well as cover crops in a lot of areas, uh, mainly covering those awkward acres that, you know, airplanes really don't want to cover uh, because they're uh, maybe, you know, 20, 30 acres or less, and they're shaped like a question mark down by the river bottom, um, and, and just kind of high risk for those, those sorts of, of applications. Uh, but the drone has a really good fit there because they can get into those small areas and make applications that might not happen otherwise, um, which is great for the grower uh, being able to get the benefit of that application. Um, so yeah, we can also look at a map like this. And if we think about traditional spray equipment, the, the green acres, um, those are the ones that, you know, you go in there with your big, you know, Hagee sprayer or uh, in a, uh, an airplane and you can apply those very easily um, and be very efficient with that. Uh, but as soon as you get into those orange acres, your efficiency goes way down. Uh, maybe the airplane doesn't want to go in there um, and it begins to, to be sort of a struggle. And, you know, you spend probably as much time on those orange acres as you do on the green acres in the map. Um, so what a drone can do is really kind of take those acres out of the equation and keep that that ground rig or that airplane a lot more efficient um, while, while utilizing the drone to really do a good job on those acres or even, you know, spray them at all. If we're thinking about some fungicide uh, applications. So a pretty, pretty useful tool to have in the toolbox there. So where do drones fit in? Well, if we think about an airplane or really a ground rig for that matter in certain applications, think of it like a zero turn lawnmower. And then if we look at the, uh, at the drone, that's really like a push mower. Now, you're not going to take the push mower, your brand new push mower, and be like, well, we don't need this zero turn mower anymore. I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy. You're, you're not going to give up the zero turn. But it is a nice complimentary piece to go in there and do the acres that uh, you might not get otherwise and then really uh, do a much better job of spraying or mowing your lawn um, than, than you would otherwise. So a drone, we can really expect... Uh, to do about 18 to 20 acres per hour on that, um, which is really good on those kind of smaller, more awkward acres, but you're not going to go out there at a big, you know, 160 acre field and, and try to replace a larger piece of equipment with that small drone. That's, that's really just, just not practical at this point in time. But uh, there's, there's also some other applications that we could do on some, some larger acres. So if we have a uh, more of a, a a zone map that we have, maybe you made it with some, some other drone technology, and maybe you're looking at this map and you want to make a fungicide application, and you look at the red acres of the field, and you're thinking, well, that's not really worth it to, to apply product because we're not going to get a return on our investment. But on the yellow and green acres of the field, that does make sense. We'll make money if we apply that. So we can very easily put a, a shape file into the drone and go and apply those areas specifically. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a game changing technology on a lot of acres where, you know, maybe you'd be like, well, it's not going to be worth it on every acre. I'm probably not going to make a lot of money. Let's skip it versus, hey, let's just address the acres that uh, where we're going to see a benefit and, and go from there. Um, there's also some some really what I would consider outside of the box use cases. So if you think about specialty crops like uh, vineyards. Uh, apple orchards, those sorts of things, those really see a lot of benefit from drones, being able to do more, uh, more custom types of applications and um, as well as aquatic applications, which isn't really something we think about a lot in agriculture, but 
if you think about like a golf course or someone with like a bass pond, um, it's pretty important for the, for those people to, uh, you know, get the algae off or, or lily pads, being able to manage those. And traditional means, um, it's kind of difficult to control those things. So um, you'll be surprised on just how much money people are willing to spend it to clear up those types of, um, of, of areas. Um, and also invasive species. And so that's, that's a very interesting one. Um, you get into range and pasture country, and if there's invasive species or, you know, scotch thistle or, or you name it, um, it can be hard to control. Like you might have to go out there with a four-wheeler or, uh, you know, maybe you could get a, a spray rig out there, but generally people don't really want to take their, you know, big spray rig out there and go after or go out on the uh, on rough ground there and tear things up. Uh, but a drone is a really good fit there and really is opening up a lot of markets that were previously were untouched there. So just lots of potential with all of that. Now, as far as the actual equipment, uh, there's been quite the evolution of application drones over just the past handful of years here. Uh, if we look over on the left there, the MG1P, that was really the first commercially available uh, application drone. And that was really good for spraying test plots. But as you got to um, you know, larger fields that were, you know, 20, 30 acres, it really wasn't quite um, scalable. Uh, last year, the T30 from DJI came out with an eight gallon tank. And um, that's really opened the door to uh, being more scalable on, on addressing some of those more awkward acre type of fields um, and do so and do a really good job at it as well. Uh, this year, the T40 from DJI came out and that's a uh, substantially bigger drone, so 10 and a half gallons. Um, that's really good for more square, larger opportunities like a, a square 40. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting drone as well. So that's, that's what's currently available today. As we look to the future, um, there's a lot of companies developing different things. Uh, one to note is Guardian Agriculture, uh, where they have uh, their, their Guardian drone with a 20 gallon tank and um, that's just really showing where, where this thing is going, just kind of bigger, faster, stronger, um, as far as research and development. Now, I will say that there is some, some talk of uh, swarming drones, and um, the MG1P did get clearance to, to be able to be swarmed, um, and that was, the FAA allowed that because it's underneath 55 pounds, um, but the T30, T40, those are over 55 pounds, and um, we as Rantizo have had our paperwork in to, to swarm the, the T30 for a while, but uh, the FAA is just a little bit shy on, on doing that. And that is because, you know, spray season, it's a long season. People are trying to get uh, a lot of acres covered. And as the season goes on, people, people get tired. And if you have a lot of drones in the field, you, you're basically juggling and you've got a lot of balls in the air at that point. And uh, if you see a drone maybe going someplace that you don't want it to go and you try to move it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't move because you're controlling a different drone um, and you crash into a tree or, you know, God forbid, a car on the road or something like that. That's a that's a problem. And so the FAA is just kind of shy about uh, about allowing that to happen. Um, I think it'll happen one day, but I think it's uh, it's going to be a while before we see that. But as far as the future of drones, where do I see this going? I see these drones getting uh, much larger and I see them starting to encroach on the, the helicopter market, you know, maybe in five, 10, 15 years from now. Um, that's, that's a very logical place for that to, to end up. Um, so uh, we'll have to stay tuned and, and see exactly what happens there. Now, as far as the, the drones that are on the market today, the main ones are the T-30 and the T-40. Now, when the T-40 came out, a lot of people looked at that and said, hey, this is newer, it's bigger, it has to be better, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if we look at the T-30, it's like a front wheel assist tractor. Um, and then the T-40 is more like a four wheel drive tractor. Now, if you're trying to plant a field with a 12 row corn planter, you're probably not gonna hook it up to the four wheel drive tractor just because it's bigger. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of overkill, right? Um, and that's kind of the same thing with the T-40. Uh, the T-40 is really designed for um, bigger fields with longer, uh, straighter runs. And the T-30 is really good as, uh, you know, kind of smaller, more awkward acres where there's lots of turns potentially, uh, just because they move in a much different way. Um, and so the T-30, it moves where the back of it is always facing towards you. So 
when it turns around at the end of the field, it doesn't really turn around. It just kind of shifts over and it turns some nozzles on and off and then comes back towards you again. And so it uh, doesn't really burn as much energy uh, turning around as what the T40 does. The T40 um, has just two nozzles at the back. So it's different than the standard T-Jet nozzles that we're all used to that are on all the previous application drones. Um, yeah, it has those spinning disc nozzles where instead of changing tips, when you wanna change something with your spray pattern, you just change your gallons per acre and the microns that you want, and it just adjusts. And it can really even do so on the fly, um, which is really interesting. But when it gets to the end of the field, it has to you know, physically turn around. And when it turns around, that burns a lot of battery. So really good on, on straight, straight shot fields and, and, and larger areas. But if you're you know, on that uh, uh, field shaped like a question mark down on the river bottom, uh, probably not not a great tool to use because you probably won't gain any efficiency on there. So just something to keep in mind as, as you start to, to plan for uh, making drone applications. All right, uh, now let's talk about getting legal here. So um, a lot of people say like, well, you know, I'm just spraying my own field. Um, why do we need to get the FAA involved? I mean, what's, what's it their business? I mean, this is my ground after all. Well, that is true that it is your ground, but once you get above the Earth's surface, you are in the jurisdiction of the Federal Aviation Administration. And they have certain requirements to, to be sure that you're, you're safe and legal there. Um, and uh, there's also some other entities that do care about things as well, such as the EPA and uh, the Department of Natural Resources as well. And usually they don't get involved unless there's a, a problem. <laughs> but when there is a problem, um, their jurisdiction um, is, is really almost unlimited, especially the DNR. Um, so it's very important to be, you know, uh, compliant with these entities and, um, you know, make sure that you don't have an issue because you could have, um, you know, pretty substantial civil fines on some of these things. Um, and, and it's just really something that you don't really want to mess with. And, uh, you know, these, these laws do exist for a reason. Um, these drones have gotten bigger and there's all sorts of videos on, on the internet of, of people really being responsible adults with these things. <laughs> so they need to be, be respected here. Um, obviously you don't wanna be um, hanging on to the bottom of a drone and having it, you know, cart you around. Um, you know, these, these drones are, are pretty big. If that blade hits you, it's not just gonna be leave a, a bruise or, or cut you a little bit. I mean, if that thing hits your jugular, I mean, it's gonna be lights out for you. These things have a lot of power and they need to be respected. Um, so as far as what you need to be, uh, get yourself uh, legal to fly, the first thing is to get your FAA Part 107 license, so your drone license, and, and I think we, we talked about that a little bit earlier here, but basically, um, you know, there's, there's some study courses out there that are great. You can study for about, you know, six to eight hours. You take a test that's typically at a local airport, and then you get your, your license there, and it's great because you learn about airspace and how to be basically a good neighbor in the sky. Uh, state pesticide applicators licenses um, that varies from state to state, but essentially just the appropriate licenses for for aerial application and uh, knowing how to do things correctly there and be safe. Uh, a visual observer. So the T30 and the T40, as of today, they do require what's called a visual observer. That's just another person uh, out there with you who basically just you know keeps an eye on. Um, the drone while, while you're out operating. And they can also help load chemicals and do other sorts of things. And it's, it's nice to have an extra set of hands, but it is a requirement to have. Uh, next is the FAA part 137. And so what this is, is basically the crop dusters license. And so that's the FAA just, um, you know, making sure that you're um, qualified to be able to dispense products onto, onto fields. Um, and there is a, a process to go through with this. It does take a lot of time and it does take some, some money as well. Um, if you were to go apply for your uh, part 137 today, it would take you between 12 and uh, 18 months to get that just with the backlog at the FAA right now, just mainly due to the, uh, the increased interest in drone applications. Um, then the last piece here is the FAA class two medical card. Um, so this is an interesting one. So the FAA just wants to be sure that, uh, you know, if you've got this drone in the air that you're, you're able to see it and that you're not going to have, you know, a heart attack or a stroke or whatever while you have this in the air while you're on the side of the field. Um, to get this, it's basically similar to like a CDL physical, but they do 
Um, look at your vision a bit more just to be sure that, that you can you know, see the drone when it's in the air. And they do also take a look at the medications you take. And some of them kind of seem a bit odd, but it is their requirements. And you know, once again, they're just trying to make sure that someone is not at risk of, of you know, having a seizure or a stroke or heart attack on the side of the field. So they do look at that. And um, th that's probably the first thing that I would uh, go through and get if I was looking to uh, get into drone applications, just because this, this is something that uh, if they find something, it could take a, a little bit to um, work through with them. There's, there's some things that, that just take a little bit to, to work through and some things just, just disqualify you. Um, so before investing a lot of time and money into this, it is good to know if, if uh, you have any issues uh, with that. So uh, the next thing to think about is setting up an actual business. So as far as the equipment side, you'll need the drone, batteries, and charger, which I at Ranty, so I can sell you all of those things. Uh, you'll also need a truck going from field to field. You'll also need generators to charge batteries to, to run your tendering pumps. Um, and a 9,500 9, running watt minimum is, is really what we look for as far as generators go. So it's not just any old generator. It's got to have a little bit of a beef to it. Um, gas generators are generally the lowest cost and, and easiest to find. Um, but diesel generators, they do cost a bit more, but they are quieter and you can get just one generator to run everything. Um, so it just kind of depends on, on what fits for your, your operation there. Uh, you also need a water tank and a mixing station. So most people use a trailer of some sort. So, you know, using a flatbed trailer, maybe you've got a flatbed trailer lying around, maybe you haul seed in the spring or heavy equipment some other times of the year. Um, and during spray season, you can, you know, put a, a tank on the, on the back of it and a mixing station and maybe some other things that you find convenient. Um, other people like enclosed car trailers, you know, maybe just a, a trailer dedicated specifically for that purpose. Um, so it's really just kind of a, a personal preference with that. Also, there's a lot of people that use truck bed tendering systems um, and they're, they're nice because you can move around very easily with them. If you're uh, maybe if you're around urban sprawl, it's nice to get in through different uh, neighborhoods. Uh, it's also good if you don't have a lot of room on the side of the road uh, where you're tendering as well. So there's there's benefits in uh, you know both systems, just kind of depending on where you're at. So uh, some questions to ask if, uh, if drones make sense for you. So think about what is the potential in your area. Uh, do you have small, awkwardly shaped acres? Do you have, you know, a potential in the specialty market as well? And, and what is the going rate for custom application in your area? Um, in Wisconsin, uh, the going rate for custom application is about $17. And so really when you charge for drone services, you start at the uh, going rate for custom application or aerial application in your area. And really you can charge a few dollars more in a lot of cases just because you're offering a premium service. Um, and you're, you're able to get into areas that, that traditional means really, really can't get into efficiently. So there is, uh, you, you can charge a few dollars more for, um, for, for custom application on this. Uh, so anyway, Iowa 1250, uh, and then Oklahoma is $7. So, you know, just kind of depending on where you're at, it's a lot easier to get started in, in Wisconsin or Iowa than it is in Oklahoma. Um, so that is something to, to consider. And yes, are you looking for a side gig? Uh, if you're only going to do this for you know a week or two out of the year, it's probably probably not worth the investment. But if you're willing to to you know make a go at this for for several weeks out of the year, this can make a lot of sense. Do you have an underemployed member of your operation? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, farming operations where you know maybe the kid wants to come back to the farm, but you know he's not. There's not enough work to really keep him employed full time. This can be a great way to, to supplement that income and get someone back on the farm, um, you know, a lot quicker. And so how many acres are you looking to cover? Um, there's, there's definitely a break even with a lot of this uh, technology, which we'll go over in a bit. Um, but yeah, if you're only looking to cover maybe a thousand acres, it might not pencil out. But if you, uh, you know, want to cover maybe 7,000 acres, well, that, that does change uh, the equation. So yeah, 7,000 acres is what we hear from a lot of really good operators on, on what, uh, what they're able to cover in a season with a drone. So as far as a, a break-even uh, analysis here, so I've got a, a spreadsheet here, and if you contact me after this, I'd be more than happy to share this with you. Um, so if we look at acres per hour, you know, the average for, for most drones out today is 18 to 20 acres per hour. 
is what we look at. And then we can look at it either, you know, cost per acre or, or dollars per hour. Um, so we can, you know, input different numbers there. Uh, and then if we figure, okay, how many hours per day do I want to spray? How many days per week? How many weeks per year do I plan on operating this thing? And we can figure out what our revenue is. And then we can also take a look at the different pieces of what goes into this. What do these things cost? And that's going to vary from person to person, but you know the drone, you know you can get set up for around you know thirty three thousand uh, dollars, give or take on that. Uh, training, uh, support, licensing, insurance, uh, a tendering setup, you know a truck and trailer generator, you know those those will vary based on your situation, what you've got lying around already. Um, so you can kind of figure out what is this going to take for me to break even on this, and uh, kind of go from there. So as far as Rantizo, what do we provide? Well, we can sell you the drone and accessories. Uh, we can do what's called flight operations. So there is that issue of the FAA part 137 and that long uh, backlog at the uh, FAA. Uh, we can get you set up under our um, uh, part 137 and really get you going in a month and a half to two months. And so there's still plenty of time for this year's spray season. Um, and so you can fly underneath ours uh, just for, for a fee and uh, be all set and, and legal, ready to go. Uh, you could use that either as just a stopgap until you, you get your own, or you could just fly underneath ours. Um, a lot of guys choose to fly underneath ours because they see this as a really a, the beginning of, a, of another industry. And the industry players really have not been established yet. So instead of spending all this time working with the FAA and, and um, you know, doing all these different things, they can just go out there and spend that time marketing themselves and really grabbing market share and establishing themselves as an industry player. Um, yeah, so it just helps you get started fast and focused uh, building your business. Training, that's, uh, you know, we've got a, a training program that's, you know, it's not just someone you know, showing you how to fly it behind the shop for an hour. Um, it's actually a structured program uh, run by industry professionals um, where we've got some, some modules that you can go through just through the comfort of, of your own office for a few days. And then we've got an actual um, two days hands-on training um, where you spend a lot of time with the, with the controllers actually in your hands flying our drone um, so you get comfortable on how to operate everything and, you know, learning things like, hey, how do I fly around, uh, you know, high voltage power lines, you know, where there's some static elect uh, electronic interference there? Um, and how do I, you know, have an efficient flight path when there's a little bit of wind? Um, so it's, it's a very elaborate program and it's, it's really great. Uh, support. So, you know, this isn't just some 1-800 number and a good luck. It's not just a single drone guru that's uh, his voicemail gets bought, uh, voicemail gets full and he'll call you back in three days. Um, this is an actual tiered system where if you have a simple question, we can get you a simple answer very quickly. If you have something that's pretty in depth, uh, we have experts, uh, including a PhD, who um, uh, can actually work on your problem and really dive into it. And they're freed up to, to work on those sorts of things. So that's, that's a, a very nice thing to, to have. And then also we have what's called a loaner drone program where if something happens to your drone in the middle of the season, like it crashes, you need a repair or, or whatever, um, we can get a loaner drone out to you while we repair that. And you can keep going and moving across acres and your season just doesn't melt away on you. So that is, that is very valuable. We also have insurance as well. That's at a, a very reasonable rate. And so we're going to cover spray claims, you know, any liability, you know, any damage. So if you crash the drone, uh, there's a lot of things that are covered there. If you crash your drone into your neighbor's pickup, we can get you covered on that as well. And, and at very competitive rates. Uh, and the last piece here is our, what we call our contractor services. So we get calls all the time um, where, you know, maybe it's uh, some, uh, jobs from a chemical company that are doing test trials. And, um, you know, there's a couple of blocks of, uh, you know, chemical trials needed done in, in a certain area. We can call you up and send those jobs to you. Also, people will find our number on the website and they have a few acres that they need sprayed and, and we can send those jobs to you as well. So um, there's, there's opportunities in different areas for that. And there's also networking opportunities with other pilots. I mean, we, we saw the map of all the pilots we have across the country. Um, there's, uh, you know, it, it's really great to be a part of something where we can share information uh, amongst other pilots. Uh, so that is uh, pretty powerful as well.
So yeah, I'm Ben Johnson. Uh, I'm a territory sales manager here at, uh, at Rantizo. And so you can reach out to me via email at ben.johnson at rantizo.com. And also you can call me at 563-271-4906 as well. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Julia. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate the very informative talk you had there. We got a lot of questions in the Q&A um, that we will start working through here. Uh, but if you have any more questions, feel free to add those now. Uh, take a snippet of the screen and contact any of the presenters from today. Um, but we'll go ahead and start answering some of those questions. So Ben and Samantha, if you want to come back on and, and turn your videos on, I have a few questions um, that we can all attempt to answer and or um, they might be more directed towards one presenter. So um, Ben, we'll start with you. We have a question in the chat for how many acres can a can a spray drone get done in a day? I know you mentioned kind of 18 yeah. to 20 acres on an earlier slide, but maybe maybe expand on that for each uh, model that you walked through in terms of the T30 and T40. Yeah, so as far as, you know, how many acres can it get done in a day? That's, um, that's kind of a difficult one to ask because, you know, the target market for the the uh, application drones right now is that small awkward acre. So there's sometimes a lot of moving around with that. Um, so that's not necessarily the metric to look at. That's why I bring up the acres per hour there, um, just because that's kind of a better yardstick to look at. Now I do hear from people who are really, you know, trying to work it, you know, about 160 acres roughly, but that, that can vary quite a bit, so. Great, and I think this one, this question kind of follows up with that. How long can each of these drones fly on one battery before they need to be replaced in terms of the timing piece there? Yeah, so basically you try to get a load off with each battery. And so that's nine to 11 minutes. And a battery lasts, like the lifespan of a battery is typically a thousand charge cycles. And so that's, that usually lasts you two to two and a half years. Awesome. And then I know batteries are one of the areas um, that kind of are a challenge for the industry as a whole. Do you have any outlook on, on how these batteries are going to move, change moving forward? Um, are there ways that we've figured out how to get more out of battery use in the field? Um, just kind of any comments around batteries there? Yeah, so battery management is, is very important. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is that there's a, a temperature range that they operate best in. Um, so keeping them cool, but yet warm at the same time. <laughs> so you want to keep them, you know, not overheating over, I think it's 150 degrees is too warm. Um, and then you don't want them, you know, below 32 degrees. So, you know, you really can't fly drones, you know, when it's freezing out. Um, so yeah, there's, there's different systems in place to, to keep them cool. There's different things that the people have done, like when they're charging, you know, keep them in the shade, let them rest for a little bit. Uh, to cool down uh, before you stick them on the charger. Um, that is the, the preferred way of, of doing things. Um, and yeah, just basically having enough batteries in rotation. So some people, you know, with application drones, they try to get by with four batteries and that's fine, but you do run into overheating sometimes on that. Um, but if you have say maybe six batteries in rotation, you're able to get by a lot better because you're able to let it cool down appropriately and uh, something goes bad wrong with one battery, you're not kind of hobbling along. So uh, yeah, having probably a few more batteries than you think starting out is, is a good thing. Awesome, thanks for that, Ben. Samantha, question for you. If I was interested in um, working with Drone Deploy, how would I get information um, to kind of get started with them? Yeah, because they're third party, you can go to their website. Anyone can access their software. Um, I believe an individual license runs around $2,000. That may have changed recently, but um, yeah, you can absolutely go check them out on your own. Um, so, Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question here for you, Ben. What's the opportunity for dry fertilizer? Um, example, urea application with the models that you currently have. Yeah, so uh, once you get to, you know, needing to apply, you know, uh, big rates over the course of a field, um, if, it's, if it's a small rate, you could probably get by with it. So, you know, the drone's probably going to carry about 60 pounds worth of dry material. Um, if you're trying to get, you know, 100 pounds out to the acre, uh, 
you start to, to get to a point where this is uh, not really an efficient tool to, to be able to, uh, to do that with, with the current models. As, as these drones get larger, I think the opportunity does, does increase. Um, I think really the target is uh, maybe if you have some sort of micronutrient that it's not a huge rate per acre uh, could be a good fit. But I mean, if you're going out there with something like, you know, uh, potash or map where you know, you've got a lot of, a lot of uh, material per acre, it might not be the, the opportunity. Thanks. One more in the chat then is what does the T30 currently cost? You can answer that. Yeah, the, the T30, it's, um, you know, with all of the, the batteries and chargers that I would recommend, it's, it'll be right around uh, 32,000. For either presenter, James in the chat has asked, what license would I need to spray my acres in a couple of neighbors fields because of helicopters not being able to make timely applications? I know we hit on this a few times, but either of you want to speak to that part 107. Yes, so you, you would need the, the part 107 license, which would be the drone application license. Uh, you would need the appropriate spray licenses uh, for your state uh, to be able to, to, you know, make aerial applications. Uh, you would need that uh, class two medical card if you were operating the T30 or the T40 that are over uh, 55 pounds. Um, and then you would also need to fly underneath a uh, part 137, so that the crop dusters license as well. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Um, one last question for you, Samantha, and then we'll wrap today's webinar. Is how long does it take to fly each of the drone deploy um, flight models as I'm planning out maybe how it would look in my operation? How long would it take to fly plant health, stand count, and maybe that panorama flight? Yeah, great question. Um, stand counts are pretty quick because you're just doing basically just a few like random uh, pictures throughout the field. So those about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, a plant health flight depending is very dependent on the size of the field. Um, I've flown those anywhere between 10 to 40 minutes. Um, so those may take one or two batteries. Two batteries is pretty common for those plant health flights. Panoramas are the quickest. They're only about five minutes. And uh, the 3D models can take a significant amount of time um, because they do take more photos. They have to go around the outside. Um, so those are typically between 30 to 40 minutes. Great, and one follow-up question that came in as you were answering that, will drone deploy be able to do final stand counts right before harvest? So later season stand counts. That's an excellent question. There are other companies that I know who have done that called tassel counts. So it might be something that drone deploy is working on. I unfortunately have not heard that they are, but um, it's a great thing that I do think a lot of companies are moving to because it's a great resource to have. So there is, it is possible to do with drones, uh, just not with for, uh, drone deploy at this time. Thank you. Uh, we are at time. So I would like to thank both of our presenters that have come on and, and given us some great content around crop scouting and crop spraying with drones. Uh, so I wanna thank Ben and Samantha for your time this morning. I wanna thank everyone for joining our webinar. That will conclude our morning together. Thanks everyone.